Welcome back. Let's talk about digital communication principles. These are important ways that a microprocessor can talk to the world around it. I'm actually going to cover this in two parts for convenience. It's all about general principles, but the, the first few bits of the contents here, that's whether it's parallel or serial, synchronous or asynchronous, simplex or duplex, and just looking a little bit about error checking. These are pretty um, foundational or fundamental topics in communications. Um, when we start getting on beyond that to USART, UART, SPI and I2C, or I2C, it starts to get into specific protocols. So because that's more towards real implementation, I'll talk about that bit separately. It's also got lots of ins and outs and fine detail that it would be good to just look at that afresh in a second part. So let's just go through the first four items on this contents list for now. First of all, we got lots of different things to talk about. There's many different digital communication standards. There's many types of communication. There's so many options. People have been doing this for years, since computers were first invented. And it's not really a surprise that there's so many options and so many possibilities. So we try to find a way of dividing this to make this whole ecosystem seem a little bit more understandable. So in general, we tend to describe things in these three ways, whether it's a parallel or serial communication methodology, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, and whether the communications is simplex or duplex. Now in practice, it's not quite as well defined as this or that. There's different degrees and different possibilities, and we'll get into that as we go along. We also should know that because there's so many options, standards are actually a great way of defining a particular way of communicating. A way of communicating, a way of talking is called a protocol. Um, a protocol is defined as a standard, and that standard says if I send you this byte, you send me that byte, you acknowledge it. And it, it covers all the different ways that you can communicate from one place to another place. So when you get two computers from different manufacturers in different sides of the world, as long as they speak the same protocol, they will be able to communicate and exchange information. So protocols are really important when there's so many options. Now, most of these protocols, they define the communication mechanism, so how we, you communicate. Some of them don't really go into great detail about how you know, what you do when you communicate. Um, some of them, they do. They, they also define the electrical communications, like whether it's 12 volts or 5 volts, or minus 12 volts. Some of them define how long the pulses are, what's the rise time on the pulses and the fall time. Some of them also define what's the connectivity standards. Uh, one example of that would be the USB connector, which defines the electrical connectivity, the mechanical connectivity, and the software protocol, how the communication mechanism works. So we will look at some examples. We won't look at USB, but we'll look at some examples that are quite commonly used. So the first one of these things that I've been um, trying to divide this ecosystem up as is whether you're communicating with parallel or serial. And the trade-off here is a trade-off between how fast you can communicate and how complex your hardware is. Serial basically means that at any one time you've only got one independent transmission link, you've only really got one thing being transmitted, so generally the basis is one bit at a time and you usually do that by varying the voltage. On the right hand side I've got a, a picture of a very common serial port Okay, maybe not so common these days, but 10 years ago when you bought a computer you'd always find a serial port on it. And this shows the serial port connectivity with just three wires. And we'll get to that in a little while. Parallel communication is different. Parallel communication, like the name says, it transfers data in parallel. So if you've got eight wires, then you can transfer eight bits or a byte in parallel simultaneously. So at any one time instant, a whole byte is travelling down those wires. In serial, at any one time instant, just a bit is travelling down. Parallel can be 8, 32 or more wires, and bundled up usually into one cable. 
very common um, method of serial communication would be um, something we'll see on, on the next couple of pages is RS-232 or EIA-232 and um, we will look at how you would use this um, to transfer a 7-bit ASCII character. But let's start with something which is not serial and that's parallel. So this ASCII character I want to transfer is the, the character W and if you look at the ASCII table W encoded in 7-bit ASCII is 10101111 in binary, that's 7 bits. 10101111. So in parallel, if you're going from a transmitter to a receiver, it's really simple. At a particular time instant, now, you set bits 0, 1 and 2 to be high, you set bits 4 and 6 to be high, which there and there, and the others to be low. So the receiver gets, counting from the top, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and it's ASCII. And in general, we would um, implement this by the transmitter setting the voltage of the pins and the receiver reading the voltage of the pins. Um, the ASCII is 7 bits, so we, we're communicating bit 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, that's 7 bits. The 8th bit, which is called bit 7, confusingly, that isn't being used in this case. It could be used for something else like error checking or whatever. So this is all great. And if I told the transmitter, okay, transmit something now, and I told the receiver, okay, read it now, that would work. The question shown down here is how does the receiver know when it should read the voltage? I mean, I have to tell the transmitter, I have to tell the receiver. Something, generally another wire, has to tie the two things together to say, okay, now, now write something, now read something. Okay, so there's a little bit more, if you're going to do this in practice, a little bit more than I've shown here. But it's the basic principle. Now if we're doing it in serial, we only got one data wire. The hardware is a lot simpler. There's just one pin on the transmitter and one pin on the receiver. And we would use the 7 bits to send um, so we would use the single bit wire to send the seven bits serially one after another. We might send a one, 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 zero, one, zero, one. Or we could do it the other way around. One, zero, one, zero, one, one, one. Now, it's got the same problem that the transmitter and the receiver need to know, they need to agree on when the receiver should read the wire. If the voltage is changing, the transmitter is changing the voltage on that wire, the receiver needs to know when to read that voltage. And all very good if the receiver can see the voltage changing and says, hey, the voltage has just changed, I need to read it now. But what happens if you're transmitting something like one 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 one? There's no change, or zero 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 zero. There's no change. The receiver doesn't know when it should read. So in practice, there's one of two things is needed: either another si another wire, a signal wire that goes from transmitter to receiver, saying, "Now read, now read, now read," or some sort of protocol that signals when the transmitter should change its output and when the receiver should start to read its input. And as I mentioned a little while ago, one of those specific protocols is RS-232. RS means recommended standard. Um, its actual standard name is EIA-232, but it got confusing, so people called it EIA slash RS-232, and then it became TIA-232. Um, but everybody still seems to call it RS-232, recommended standard. And it was recommended in the 1970s, I think, and it became an actual standard in the 1980s. So if you don't mind being 40 years old in your terminology, we can call it RS-232. 
and it defines it's a protocol it's a protocol that defines not mechanical characteristics but electrical signals and what they mean the data there's many options in RS-232 but I've shown an example here so this is showing a bit stream as time along the x-axis and it starts just here and the first bit that's transmitted is a start bit it's an indicator from the transmitter to the receiver saying hey I'm about to transmit something the transmitter then sends bit 0 bit 1 bit 2 note that they're low Oh, they're minus 12 volts, minus 12 volts, minus 12 volts. And that's because RS-232 is a weird standard where the logic high is voltage low. So logic 1 is minus 12 volts, logic 0 is plus 12 volts. Yeah, I know it's weird. So the start bit, the transmitter flips the wire to 12 volts and says, I'm about to transmit something. The receiver then starts to listen. It, it reads at minus 12 sorry it reads a minus 12 another minus 12 another minus 12 plus 12 minus 12 that's what happens when I click the screen <laughs> minus 12 plus 12 minus 12 and at this point it's transmitted a 1111011 one, 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 zero, one, zero, one, which is from least significant bit one 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 zero one zero one okay it then follows that with the parity bit it's something we'll look at in a little while and then it follows it with two stop bits which the protocol uses to tell the receiver that the transmission has stopped so out of those many options that RS-232 has this example that I'm showing here is first of all it's transmitting the least significant bit first that is this one just here second one is it's having one start bit to signal the beginning of transmission the third one is it's using a parity bit which is an odd parity bit and we'll get to that in a moment and the fourth thing is it's using two stop bits it could use even parity or no parity. It could have one or two start bits, and it could have one or two start bits. There's all sorts of different options that uh, RS-232 can have. So let's just think about this in generalities, not thinking about RS-232 or something. In parallel communication usually transmits one bit per line at a time. Whereas serial communication transmits one bit after another, after another, after another. So each time instance is transmitting one bit. So because of that, serial's transmission rate is quite low. But also because it's toggling the line very frequently, it actually has to toggle the line about eight times more frequently than 8-bit parallel, or 32 times more frequently than 32-bit parallel, that means that the, the signals are changing rapidly. And what that, the implication of that is that the uh, allowed signal length for RS-232 is actually, is actually quite, sorry, the, the, uh, the allowed signal length or, or wire length for these types of protocols is, is quite short. Um, parallel communications can generally go over longer distances. That's not always true, but this is um, in general terms. Parallel is usually more expensive because basically there's more wires, there's more pins, and there's more driver circuitry and sensing circuitry. Serial is cheaper. And serial, because it's cheaper and because it only uses one pin, it tends to have higher energy efficiency than parallel systems. So a parallel system, if you've got eight pins, you've got eight driver circuits. Each driver circuit is using energy. But you will also know that in integrated circuits, that when you start toggling things quickly, they start to use more energy than when you toggle things slowly. So although serial tends to be higher energy efficiency, if you're not 
doing this sensibly, then you lose some of that efficiency because the clock speed is high. So we're not going to get into the energy efficiency too much here. Uh, and again, there's lots of options. But we'll just uh, go to this note at the bottom here. So in general, I've been saying that you use usually high or low voltages to represent bits. Um, it's not entirely true because there's lots of clever coding schemes where you can send more data over a single wire. So a single wire, you can use something like ADSL, asymmetric digital subscriber line. That's how people often access the internet. It uses a single telephone line, but it does some very complicated coding to squeeze lots of data down there. Uh, sometimes the coding schemes mean that you need two wires to transfer one bit. So LVDS, low voltage differential signaling, is a scheme that, that um, communicates serial data. But instead of one wire for each bit, it's got two wires per bit. And it toggles the wires. It does this to reduce noise. LVDS is the type of technology you use to connect your computer to your TV. Um, it's used in HDMI connections, for example. It's used inside a laptop to get data from the motherboard up to the LCD display. Very high speed, um, very low energy, and causes very little I interference because of that. So there's lots of possibilities here. I also should just mention this Note 1 I've got down here. We were also talking about transmitting uh, let's say a byte at a time. So at this time instant you're transmitting 8 bits and the next time instant you're transmitting another 8 bits. But actually what Serial does is it transmits a bit now, the next bit now, the next bit now, the next bit now. When you start to transfer more things on parallel, let's say multiple bytes, what you see is that each parallel line is actually operating like a serious line, a serial line. So bit zero, 0 in the parallel interface is transmitting something now, 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 now. If you just look at that on its own, it looks like serial. I know this is very strange. So the distinction between parallel and serial is not quite as well defined as we might like. But in the simplest terms that we're looking at here, then they are distinct. Now, we saw this example where we're transmitting 1110101. Okay. Now put yourself in the place of the receiver. Imagine you're the receiver and somebody sends you a signal. And that signal looks like the thing that's drawn on the screen here. If that's all you've received, if that's all you've received on your input pin, the question I have to ask is, how do you know that this is a sequence of bits? 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. And it's not a sequence of bits like this. 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. All I'm doing is I'm reading the input pin twice as frequently. So I read this input pin once here when the signal is high, but I read it once there and I read it again there. So the answer is that actually we need something else there. We need either a separate clock signal or the transmitter and the receiver, they need to agree how frequently the receiver should be reading that pin. They need to agree on timing. And timing is critical for any serial interface, probably any parallel interface too. So then we get synchronous transmission. So instead of oh, just one wire from transmit to receive, we have two wires. One wire conveys the data just like it did for any other serial system. And the second wire conveys a clock. And the clock, coming from the transmitter, it basically tells the receiver when the receiver should be looking at the input pin. And that's the function of the red 
arrows shown on here. They're on rising edges of the clock. So whenever that clock edge goes high, it goes from low to high, the receiver is supposed to read what's the voltage on the data pin. And if it does that all the way through, then we know that the receiver will read the right data. Okay. So this is very common. It's common because it's quite reliable. But there's a problem because you're transmitting down these two wires. One of those wires is a clock signal. And that tends to cause a lot of interference in electrical circuits. Of course, you're also doubling the amount of pins and doubling the amount of power that this circuit's going to consume. So yes, it's reliable, but it's got some disadvantages. This is synchronous transmission. Asynchronous is what we saw originally, where there's no clock signal and there's just one data wire. Now, how you do this in practice is that the receiver, it contains a, an internal fast clock and a timer. When the start bit is sent on the data pin, on the data wire, when the start bit is sent from the transmitter, the receiver says, oh, there's a start bit, and it loads a counter, and it starts to count down, 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 until it reaches zero. When it reaches zero, the receiver reads the input pin. It reloads the counter, and counts down to zero again in which case it reads the input pin and it does that for each subsequent bit reading the data one 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 zero one zero one zero one one so the good thing about this is there's fewer pins and wires and the hardware is actually pretty simple I mean it's just a driver pin and an internal clock and counter and we already know that every microprocessor already has an internal clock and most of them already have internal counters or timers. The disadvantage is that if timing is ever out everything is wrong. I mean if that counter starts in the wrong place every other bit that's received is completely incorrect. And the value that gets loaded into the timer that needs to be agreed between the receiver and the transmitter. Basically, the programmer that programmed the transmitter needs to tell the receiver how frequently the transmitter is changing its bits. They need to agree on timing. Whatever the transmitter has for its bit rate, the receiver needs to agree. That's also called a board rate. We'll look at that again later. So just to sum up, synchronous transmission is you've got two wires, you've got a data wire and you've got a clock. It's pretty reliable because the clock signal is there telling the receiver when to sample. Asynchronous transmission is lower power, much simpler because there's only a simple wire and the receiver internally needs to know how often the transmitter is toggling its transmit bit and then the receiver needs to sample based on the delay that's agreed, or the timing that's agreed between the receive and transmit. So that's parallel, serial, uh, asynchronous and synchronous. The, the one other division is simplex or duplex. And you can see there's three different possibilities on this screen, so it's not just a binary one. The easy one first, simplex means you communicate in one direction. So you've got a transmitter and a receiver. You've got a device A and a device B. A transmits to B. A transmits to B. A transmits to B. And it carries on. A always transmits to B. A always transmits to B. That's simplex. Full duplex means that there's simultaneous communication. A and B communicate. And then sometime later, A and B communicate. And sometimes later, A and B communicate. On the other hand, half duplex transmission means that usually there's one transmission channel, it might be one wire, and they take turns to do this. A transmits to B, B transmits to A, 
A transmits to B, B transmits to A, and they take turns. And different communication standards do this in different ways. Uh, a broadcast system, for example, a TV transmitter that's transmitting old style analog TV signals or even new digital TV signals from Bukit Timah Hill to all of Singapore, that's simplex. The transmitter is transmitting and you can receive or you don't receive, but you can't send anything back to that TV transmitter. Full duplex is that the systems are always communicating simultaneously. Um, that's how it seems with the internet. That's how the internet feels from a human perspective. It's actually not quite like that. Because the internet can use different technologies, some of which is full duplex, some of which is half duplex. An example of half duplex is the, um, the old-fashioned networking cables. And often the, the really old-fashioned networking cables would be half duplex communications or the older Wi-Fi standards um, 802.11a for example this would be um, there's a single wavelength or, or a single bandwidth in the air through which something can transmit to something else and then after a while the listening and transmitting devices swap over what was the listener starts to transmit and what was the transmitter starts to listen and they take turns communicating in that way but very fast thousands of times per second GSM your mobile phone communication this traditionally used half duplex communications well, there's, there's lots of different possibilities these days but the original brick mobile phones used half duplex So we get on to this, this final topic in this part of the um, lecture segment, and that's error correction and error checking. So I'll pose a question here. Can the receiver know if it's received something that contains an error? Well, if you think about this, it won't always know, right? If the receiver is just getting a byte of information, that that byte it could be anything. How does it know that byte's got an error? It can't tell unless the transmitter sends some extra information. So as a programmer, you can tell the transmitter to send more information. And that information could contain an error check code. And the simplest error check code is a parity bit. But there's others. There's many other types of error check codes. There's some really complicated ones that are used. Uh, error check codes can be simple, like parity, or they can be quite powerful. In general, all they do is that when something, when a receiver receives some data, an error check code will help the receiver to understand if there's an error in what it's received. No error check code is foolproof. But you can measure how good they are, um, how often they get things wrong. And they can become very good indeed. So I'll pose the second question now. If the receiver receives something that's got an error, what can it do about it? Can it fix that error? And in general, there's two ways of doing it. You're the programmer. You can tell the transmitter to upgrade, not just send error check codes, you can tell the transmitter, hey, send error correction codes. This is additional data that the transmitter sends to help the receiver know that there's a problem. I'll tell you the very simplest error correction code. It's to send everything three times. The transmitter sends every bit three times. And the receiver gets three bits. If they're all the same, then the receiver says, no problem, there was no error. But if they're not all the same, and the receiver says that one bit is a zero, the other two bits are ones, then the receiver's going to say, okay, there's an error here. 
Um, but which bit is in error? Well, it's probably the first bit, the zero, because the other two are ones. So it would do majority voting, and it would decide that the actual correct bit is a one. Now, this is really wasteful. This means you transmit three times as much data as you need. There's much more efficient ways of doing error correction. And if you have a duplex connection, so if there's a way for the receiver to communicate back to the transmitter, then it's very simple. The transmitter transmits a byte to the receiver, and it contains a parity bit. The receiver looks at that byte. If it sees that there's a, the parity bit is not what it expects, it says, hey, that byte has got an error. And it can then send a message back to the transmitter saying, hey, can you resend that, please? The transmitter will then resend it. And this is what's used in networking. It's used in TCP IP. TCP is Transmission Control Protocol. It specifically allows a device to send a packet and then the receiver to request a resend. So it's very common, this type of technology. I promised you I'd talk about parity bits. And we noticed the parity bit in the RS-232 example earlier. Well, it's a single bit, in this case, that the transmitter appends, that means adds to the end of each transmitted symbol, byte. Okay, seven bits. All right, so the transmitter is sending seven bits. Now, you can have odd parity or even parity by adding one more bit to make it eight bits. Odd parity, the transmitter makes sure that whatever bit it sends the overall number of ones is an odd number. And for even parity, the transmitter inserts a bit, and the bit it inserts makes sure that the overall number of ones is even. Let's just see some examples, make it easier. If this is the seven bit information that's being sent, I've got four examples. Let's say we're talking about an even parity scheme. So if the transmitter is sending 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, then the transmitter needs to add a bit which is a 1, because that means that the total number of 1s being transmitted is even. If the transmitter was working with an odd parity scheme, then it would send a 0 instead. So it would transmit 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, zero. So the total number of ones transmitted is an odd number. Here's another example, one zero 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 zero. It's the same, there's only one digit one in that example. Down here we got one one zero zero one one zero. There's one, two, three, four ones even parity would have the transmitter transmit a zero because there's already an even number of high bits. Odd parity would have the transmitter transmit a one to make it five one bits. This is also even, so even parity would transmit nothing, oh, sorry, transmit a low bit, odd parity would transmit a high bit. So how it works, the receiver receives 8 bits and it looks at the number of 1s in that 8 bits. And if the programmer told the receiver that even parity is being used, then the receiver would expect there to be an even number of 1s. If not, there's an error. If the programmer told the receiver, hey, you're using odd parity, then the receiver would count the number of ones. If there's an odd number, the receiver would say, hey, there's an error. And in fact, this scheme can also detect if there's three bit errors. Okay, let me give you an example. If the transmitter transmits zero, one, sorry, the transmitter transmits in even parity, Zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. Okay? If there's three bit errors, maybe the receiver gets one, 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 zero, 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 one. How many ones? One, two, 
three, four, five, there'll be an error flagged. But I've down, written down here that the receiver cannot detect if there's two bit errors. And the reason why is that if there's two bit errors, then two bits are flipped. What's being received hasn't changed in terms of being even or odd. If two bits flipped, either two zeros have turned to two ones, or two ones have turned to two zeros, or one one turned to a zero and another zero turned to a one. It doesn't change the number of high or low bits. So this is how parity works. It's very common, commonly used, but it's not very powerful. So we've seen parallel and serial, we've seen synchronous and asynchronous, we've seen simplex and duplex, and I've said that these are ways to try to divide the massive ecosystem of digital communication systems down into more easily identifiable bits. And we also looked at error checking we looked at error check codes and parity was an example and we talked about uh, the fact that you could do error correction as well which we're not really going to look into. So we finished the general principles. Uh, in the second half of this I'll just go through the USART and UART and then two example protocols which are SPI and I2C.